Hello and welcome to yet another exciting episode of iBuzz. I'm your host, Nosheen Bukhari, bringing you the latest and most exciting entertainment news. In today's episode, we will pay a tribute to Amy Winehouse, followed by a movie review on I Am Legend. But first things first, let me quickly take you to the top stories of the day. Celebrities celebrate the 10th death anniversary of Amy Winehouse. Jamila Jamil announces plans for Marvel She-Hulk live-action film. Meghan Merkel under fire for putting a royal family through commercialized style branding. John Travolta honors wife Kelly Preston's last role. And Ron and Keating accepts phone hacking damages. To pay the tribute to the late singer, we are joined by entertainment journalist Jamie Lowe. Jamie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. So, Jamie, being a young person, I think you can feel it too. I can feel it too. It's, it's a heart heartbreaking moment from a tremendously talented star who fell too quickly. I mean, I'm around the age that Amy Winehouse died right now. And um, I, I've been a fan of her since mm. childhood, since the early sort of 2000, sorry, the, the late 2000s before we hit uh, mm. sort of 2010. She yeah. was one of the first artists that I really got into. Um, and because I was young back then, I didn't really understand mm. the context and this whirlwind that was going on around such an artist that I admired. Yeah. And Jamie, keeping her strong vocals in mind, how would you define Amy's music? Oh, jazz, ultimately jazz, but jazz mm -hmm. that was made accessible to a commercial and wider audience in that second album, Back mm -hmm. to Black. Jamie, there are very few singers in the modern world music today who are actually musicians. Uh, Amy was that perfection who knew how to create music and would not simply rely on music composers. Why do you think we are getting deprived of this genuine music in today's world now? Well, I think it was Amy's sort of classical training. And when I say classical, I don't mean that she attended a conservatoire or anything like that. She grew up listening to the greats, Frank Sinatra, Billie Holiday. Mm -hmm. uh, all these people inspired her and informed her music choices. For Amy, mm -hmm. music came first. It wasn't stardom, it wasn't yeah. fame, although Admittedly, she probably did want to be famous and successful, hmm. but that stuff was secondary to the craft of music. Now, she was a guitarist. In her earlier gigs, you'd often see her playing guitar um, hmm. as she performed. And a really interesting thing about Amy that I really admire is a lot of her music was recorded live. So mm -hmm. artists now composite their vocals. So they take the best sounding vowels and they mix words together. But Amy did it all live. And hmm. I think that's a true, um, a true way to see that mm -hmm. she was an actual musician who cared about the music first. Mm -hmm. And her passing, in fact, made her a part of a morbid group of stars known as the 27 Club, like Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin and Kurt Cobain before her, who also died at the age of 27. Most of these people had one thing in common, which is substance abuse. Now, do you think the immense pressure is the reason behind famous singers either dying of substance abuse or uh, it, is a, it, it is a matter of suicide? Or do you think there could be another possible reason? Well, I was watching a film last night called Claiming Amy on the BBC, yeah. which was um, sort of heavily, um, there was a lot of input from her parents. And what they sort of said was, that it was mental health. She was medicating mental health. She had severe mental yeah. health problems. And back in those times, I mean, mental health is a buzzword here in the UK. Everybody mm -hmm. is talking about mental health. Everybody is, you know, considering their own mental health. Mm -hmm. But back in the early 2000s, that wasn't really a thing. Absolutely. So her parents said that that's what she was doing. She was just, was just trying to make her way in the world with some really severe mental health issues. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, Drugs and alcohol found her before adequate treatment. Mm -hmm. Right. And is it, it is also sad to learn that Amy Winehouse never seemed to realize how inspirational or influential she was, instead mired in highly publicized personal and legal troubles most of the times. 
Well, I think early on in her career, she, you know, she filled up the stage. She was smiling. Mm -hmm. She was a performer. If you look at her very early performances, yeah. she is a very different character to the one in the late 2000s mm -hmm. to sort of 2010 time. So something changed in her. So I think it was probably the success. She probably didn't think that she deserved the success. I mean, it's really hard to get a real understanding of what that was all about. But if you listen to her parents and her friends, mm. I think it was really a mixture of things which took sort of that bright Amy that was there at the start of her career away. Mm. And although she was fantastically successful because of her musical talent, maybe that light had gone out a little bit and that's where we lost her along the way. Maybe. And Amy's music remains resonant a decade later while her premature death serves as a cautionary tale about the toll of stardom. What is your take on that? Yeah, but, but stardom, yeah, the press definitely were awful to her and talk show hosts made jokes about her bulimia and mm -hmm. drug addiction. But I think ultimately, I think what we're seeing now is that she was really, she was really hard done by. She really had a difficult time of it. Yeah. And, but the thing is though, and I, you know, I don't know anyone with addictions. I've never had a family member or a friend mm -hmm. that struggled with addictions, but I've spoken to people who have, and it's really hard to get through to people. So if Amy wasn't a superstar, mm -hmm. maybe she would have found treatment, but because she had all of these other things going on and tours, hmm. it was really hard to get her into rehab and to make her stay there. Right. Uh, there seems to be a few discoveries about the unpublished music by Amy. Uh, David Joseph, the CEO and chairman of Universal Music UK, claims to have destroyed all of Amy Winehouse's unreleased material to prevent any future um, album releases. Do you think that this was a favorable attempt to save Amy's music? I mean, he said he did that because he didn't want them to be exploited after her death. But her dad, Mitchell, had a different view. He called David an idiot for doing that. <laughs> um, but Mitchell did say that he, they do have some of Amy's recorded material, which um, I'm just reading an article in the BBC just before we started mm. talking. And he says that he might release it. Um, I, I don't know. I would have liked to hear a third album. Mm -hmm. But remember, she was really in a dark place at that point. So maybe it isn't the right thing to do to release her, you know, sort of most darkest musings after her yeah. death. Maybe if she had survived and mm -hmm. got better and could reflect on it and say that was a portion of my life mm -hmm. where I was going through a really tough time and here is the art that I produced. But to release it after her death, maybe not sure about that but you know she has got a foundation the amy winehouse foundation mm -hmm. um which supports women going through similar struggles as her so mm -hmm. maybe a re-release of some stuff could help to support that charity i'm not sure how the rights work mm -hmm. and unlike many other young female singers amy didn't root for fame she mentioned it in an interview once that she doesn't write songs because she wants her voice to be heard or she wants to be famous she hated fame and was more focused on creating great music. Now, that is a very rare trait, a very rare element that a star carries with them, and a Amy had it in her. Well, remember, she was in the age when social media was really in its infancy, so mm -hmm. stardom is a totally different thing now. Mm -hmm. I wonder what Amy would have been like if she was just coming up now. Maybe it was better for her that she didn't. So, yeah, we really saw a true artist that couldn't handle the pressures, that needed some help, hmm. but maybe was forced to work when she really shouldn't have been. Hmm. Uh, also, Amy was more focused on singing rather than performing. This is, again, a very rare trait that we do not see in, in modern day's music. Singers, especially female singers, are mo more focused on the performances, the stage performances, rather than, you know, the vocals, the singing. But Amy's focus was to, you know, grab a mic, you know, sit on her pianos and start singing, and that's how she would indulge the crowd into her singing. And that is yet another uh, very, you know, rare trait, which we no longer see in modern day music. How would you comment on that? Well, I'm not sure that's true. I'm sure there are many artists out there that mm. um, really take their craft seriously. But mm. 
you know, she was never, you know, what they call a main pop girl. She was never a Gaga or a Britney or an Ariana Grande who do put on these huge, massive shows. Yeah. She made her genre of music accessible to an audience of billions. Hmm. So she hmm. had to perform that in her true, authentic way. So that was more intimate with a live band and a, and a brass uh, section and, and uh, you know, support singers off to the side. She had to do it in her way because it, I don't think an Amy Winehouse song would have fitted uh, an all singing, dancing, mm -hmm. firework performance in an arena. Right. Uh, there are so many singers, Jamie, uh, like Amy Winehouse, who have hidden messages in their songs about struggle, especially in terms of mental health issues. But sadly, people just listen to those songs as part of the entertainment and no one tries to read between the line. Now, how would you comment on that and how can this solve the problem by understanding the lyrics of a certain song and, you know, trying to address the, the problem that a certain singer is going through? Well, I was watching um, the Oscar winning documentary Amy last night, the 2015 mm -hmm. film, and what they do is they play songs and mm -hmm. put the lyrics on the screen against storytelling of mm -hmm. different parts of Amy's life. And I've got to say, they ring true. She said that she can only write a song after mm -hmm. she's lived an experience. Yeah. And after watching that film again for the second time, um, I definitely see that's true. You know, looking back, all the words mm -hmm. add up to her life experience. Right. Uh, about her documentary, uh, Reclaiming Amy, it marks the 10th anniversary of her death and is narrated by her singer mother, Janice Winehouse. Her mother, who rarely spoke publicly about her daughter, says in the film that she was prone to addiction. She could not stop herself. It's a very cruel beast. Do you think this should be watched and taken as a warning or a lesson by the emerging artists? Mm, yeah, I mean, I think Amy was, you know, Amy. She was a very specific mm -hmm. character. You know, not everyone is going to be like Amy, but mm -hmm. there are things that we can learn as a society and as a whole. And that is to put an artist's mental mm -hmm. health before anything, especially yeah. if they are prone to things like bulimia, eating disorders mm -hmm. and addictions. You know, we're seeing the same thing with Britney Spears, yeah. a young artist. Absolutely. You know, Amy and Britney were very close in age. Mm -hmm. A young artist catapulted into stardom very quickly um, with little control over their own career mm -hmm. and, and life, maybe. So maybe it's a warning for the music industry and also society mm -hmm. as a whole. Right. Jamie, thank you very much indeed for being with us. Thanks a lot. That was Jamie Lowe paying tribute to Amy Winehouse. And now moving to other story details of the day. Jamila Jamil recently announced her partnership with the Marvel Cinematic Universe in a new action-packed role as She-Hulk. The Good Place actor announced the news on TikTok as part of her official debut on the platform. She captioned the video with sneak peeks showcasing all of the intense training she's undergoing with music accompaniment from Eye of the Tiger by Survivor. There have been currently no additional details released regarding the superhero's debut, except for casting, which includes Tim Roth as Bruce Banner, as well as Hamilton star Renee Goldsbury as Ginger Gonzaga. Meghan Merkel has come under fire for allegedly attempting to commercialize the royal family through American-style branding. The claim has been brought forward by royal expert Tom Quinn, who told they wanted to be Sussex royals. Again, this is an American culture thing coming via Meghan. She, having crossed the Atlantic, began to think we have got to be a brand. That terrible word that the royal family would always think they are talking about brands, it's awful. Mr. Quinn also pointed out how the pair always wanted to be Sussex royals, but they were told they could not be what they wanted to. John Travolta remembered his late wife over the weekend by posting a clip from her final film. Travolta shared a trailer from the film Off the Rails, which was the last movie for his wife, Kelly Preston, who died in July 2020 following an undisclosed battle with breast cancer. She was 57. The movie centered around a group of women who, following the loss of their friend to cancer, set off on a journey that she has arranged for them with her teenage daughter. Jenny Seagrove and Sally Phillips co-star with Preston as friends of the late woman. Travolta posted a caption to his Instagram that says, Off the Rails is Kelly's last film. 
She was very proud of it and of all the wonderful talent that she got to work with in it. Ronan Keating has accepted substantial damages from the publisher of the News of the World over phone hacking. The High Court heard on Monday that the singer had identified a number of suspicious articles published between 1996 and 2011, which he said contained his private information. The former Boys' Own member, and now a presenter on the BBC's The One Show, brought legal action against News Group newspaper in April 2020, claiming his voicemail messages had been intercepted by NGN journalists. And that is it from our newsroom. We will be right back after a quick short break. Stay tuned to find out more. Welcome back. It's time to review the 2007 release, I Am Legend. Robert Neville, a scientist, is the last human survivor of a plague in the whole of New York. He attempts to find a way to reverse the effects of the man-made virus by using his own immune blood. This Will Smith star succeeded in bagging $585.3 million on box office. To review the movie, we are joined by TV presenter Jean-Paul. Jean, welcome to the show. Good morning, Nasheen. Lovely, lovely, lovely to be here with you. <laughs> Thank you very much. First things first, what do you think of the way they created the look of Manhattan in I Am Legend? Well, I think, to, to, be, to be honest with you, I think that the, the look was a little bit, a little bit scary, uh -huh. a little bit freaky for me. <laughs> because it's otherwise a very crowded place overwhelmed you know there is a hustle and bustle all the time but then when you see the movie you know manhattan all the streets are empty it gives a very very scary look especially when you relate it to the current times yeah i mean um there's there's a lot to be said for you know the look and feel of an apocalypse mm -hmm. um the fact it was so empty and not just mm -hmm. one street the entire it city, was empty yeah. For the whole you know how many ever blocks like 10 mm -hmm. 15 20 30 blocks in america which is totally unheard of mm -hmm. that right. look really gave it a very very empty mm -hmm. lonely and a very eerie feel mm -hmm. and of course there was a lot of relevance of the topic with the current situation of the pandemic so of course the story remains remarkable but what others what other aspects do you think uh make i am legend stand out from other i series like i robot or even you know movies from the same genre um i think there was the fear factor mm -hmm. i mean i robot i robots um you know even will smith's independence day mm -hmm. Um, focus. There was always a lot of um, Will Smith in the films, his, his personality, his character. Mm -hmm. um, in this one, there was a lot less, I think, of Will Smith in there mm -hmm. and more of Will Smith who's been damaged, you know, he'd been mm -hmm. damaged by what was going on. Yes. Um, and I think the writing behind it was because it was more, it was less thriller, less mm -hmm. comedy, mm -hmm. and more focused on the kind of scary you know, zombie um, apocalypse kind of um, feel. Um, mm -hmm. For me, it, it, it kind of put him out into a new range, a new genre of movies. Hmm. Um, it's not something you could do a lot of frequently, but it really did put him out there in terms of um, something that, that you wouldn't normally associate with a, with a fun character like Will Smith. It mm -hmm. wasn't a fun film. Right. And the movie received a bit, of, a bit of backlash because of Willow Smith's edition and some critics declared it as nepotism. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, critics are always going to have um, an issue with Will Smith and his uh, kids. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Jaden in uh, In Pursuit of Happiness yes. with Will Smith. Brilliant performance. Mm. Um, but again, a lot of criticism because he's, you know, Will Smith's son. And then in After Earth, I thought, again, a great performance. But again, you're always going to have that criticism. I think, mm -hmm. you know, Will Smith is always going to have um, that criticism with his children in the mm -hmm. same film. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. because um, of the way that maybe he has that relationship with them. He has a he has a mm-hmm. good relationship with his kids. Yes. And I think critics are always going to criticize him for the relationship that he has with them because it's not the kind of standard rela- it's a very good relationship mm-hmm. but it's not maybe your your standard relationship that you you might like to see in society absolutely and jean for some reason uh will smith's stars you know automatically become a one man show although um, there are a lot of other movies which you know contain a lot of other actors which are you know widely known in hollywood but where there is will smith it automatically becomes all about him even with this movie the same thing happened Uh, so how would you define Will Smith as a performer? Um, he, we all know that he started off as a comedian, but then his journey from a comedian of Fresh Prince of Bel Air to uh, I Am Legend, how would you define his development as, a char- um, as an actor? Well, I think he's got a lot of charisma. He has, mm-hmm. he has a lot of appeal. He has a lot of charisma. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from the days of Fresh Prince, there was a lot of interest in him. He was very fresh. A comedic mm-hmm. and he took that comedy into films independence day um men in black yeah. so he's managed to to adopt that persona and use it in films mm-hmm. even films which are you know quite expensive blockbuster films and they have very much become mm-hmm. very much about him although he had martin lawrence and he might have a co-actor but it is very much about him yeah. um and i think that that is the appeal for a lot of people So yeah, films like I Am Legend, where it's very much a sole role and it very much is about him, mm-hmm. that's true. And it, he, he, he has tried to move away from that with films like um, Suicide Squad. Yes. And I don't think it worked too well, to be mm-hmm. honest, because again, he's such a big character that the rest of the squad don't really get as much of a look in <laughs> as much as Will Smith. So I think you're right. He's very much a, a sole artist and I think he has mm-hmm. to very much... Um, films has to be very much written around him. Mm-hmm. He's not. Uh, it's not that he's not a team player, but I yeah. think he's just such a big character. It's very, very hard for him to be with other characters, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And John, there, there was a very telling line quoted by Will Smith when he mentioned Bob Marley's incident to Anna in the movie. I would really like you to comment on that because uh, what I feel is that the entire gist of the movie, you know, that was captured in that one scenario where, where he's explaining that how. Bob Marley was shot, but then he's, you know, waking up again and trying to get back to his people, saying that if they're going to keep, I mean, I, I don't exactly remember the line, but it says that if they're going to keep, you know, uh, ending the nice people, um, this doesn't mean that the world will, you know, stop being nice. Or It was something like that, so something of that sort. So how would you, you know, comment on, on that uh, scene? Yeah, I, I, do you know what, same as you, I kind of remember the, the, the scene and the line without exactly mm-hmm. remembering it. But I <laughs> yeah. think the, the ethos, I, that's I think the you're same right. Case the, with the, me. The, the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's one of, it's, it's the ethos behind it is that he captured something that Bob Marley was trying to say, which is, yeah. um, you know, don't worry, do love the people. And it yeah. was very simple. The lyrics were very, very simple about mm. trying to find your way back through mm. humanity, through love. Hmm. Um, and to be honest, I think that even though that was a line in the film, mm-hmm. that's one of the things that we do credibly believe about Will Smith. He is a very loving character. Yes. Um, and you could always believe that he identifies in his heart with mm-hmm. people like Bob Marley or influencers, um, yes. maybe philanthropists in life that do have that love mm-hmm. um, message of love. Because I think Will Smith delivers that very well. He's very authentic. In that way absolutely. absolutely and back in those days when inclusivity or diversity was not even a topic in hollywood will smith would make sure that with his presence in any movie that part is covered 100 do you know what's really interesting mm-hmm. about will smith as a character is that you don't think of him as black mm-hmm. or white or yeah. any other color If you really think about Will Smith, you just think about him as an actor who's got comedic lines, mm-hmm. um, who's very joyful, who's very happy. Mm-hmm. You never really think about him. He, he kind of leaps from one, you know, um, genre of film to another. And and his, his I think his persona of diversity is well seen. That is why his children are so diverse and accepted yes. by him and the mum, because Jada, because... 
you know, he just doesn't have that persona of I'm a black man. Hmm. You know, he has that persona of I'm a man hmm. that is a worker, that is comedic, that's hardworking, that supports my family. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that's the universal appeal of Will Smith, whether you're white, black, Asian, from China, mm, you'll like him because he does have that diverse image, you know? True, true. Uh, coming back to the movie, uh, Jean, uh, it is very difficult to, you know, develop a story out of one character because at some point the story, the movie, you know, narrow downs the, the characters. They're like left with only two or three characters at the end. But the movie doesn't seem to drag. Normally it happens. Like we have seen in other movies, Cast Away, a few other movies where just there is just one person at the end. The characters are you know <laughs> narrowed down to one person. But this movie does not give you the feel of being dragged. What what are your thoughts on that? I would agree. I think I think the the reason being primarily is that there's there's only one person in the movie to start off mm -hmm. with. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's one main character to start off with and a, mm -hmm. and a bunch of zombies. <laughs> so at the end of the movie, you still have one main character exactly. and a bunch of zombies. So they're not sort of whittling it down to one at, at the end. Mm -hmm. I think there's that. But also ca carried through the whole film is yeah. this sense of hope. Mm -hmm. Because even though there is only him and a bunch of zombies and it looks like there's no hope, we know that there are other people out there and we know that he's working on some sort of formula. Yes. And even though we don't get to see, you know, how that works out, we're left with that sense of hope that somehow people are going to be cured. Mm -hmm. So even though it, it, we don't see, you know, less people or more people, we have this feeling, we have, we, mm -hmm. we have, we have that understanding that people will be cured as a mainstream group somewhere else later on. Absolutely. Jean, it was great reviewing this movie with you. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you so much, Nasheen. You have a lovely day and happy day to all you guys at Indus News. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was Jean Paul reviewing I Am Legend, and that is it from today's episode. We will see you next time. Until that time, don't forget to share your feedback on the social media link mentioned down below. Take care and goodbye.